Yep, yep. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. You don't get nervous about these things because you, you're relaxed in life, aren't you? Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty laid back. About the Sometimes, I don't know, it's, we're never really, um, if it's a sort of big gig, I tend to be less nervous, which I, don't, I can't really quite work that one out, but it, is it sort of smaller places, I just sort of, you know, freak out a bit before we play, but... Is it because of the big gigs? There are so many people that uh, you can't actually keep them eye to eye. But when you're in a so. small venue, if you're doing King Tut's in Glasgow or somewhere in, you yeah. know, at home in Bells Hill or whatever, you're you're yeah. staring the people in the eye. It's something like that because I mean, you know, people are sort of right next to you in a small venue. It's sort of easier for them to get at you. They mm. don't like what you're doing. They can sort of beat you up if they want. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't happen very. That. that doesn't happen happen very often no, at your gigs these days. No, it's not happened to us yet, but um, I'm, I'm sure it will. Sometimes somebody will have a go at us. It's good to hear another band coming out of the west of Scotland because I worked there for a long time, and you know, at the time I was there, the bands that were breaking through, I think people like Wet 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 and yeah. you know Deacon Blue, and you've sort of quietly worked away. I mean, it's almost uh, it's almost that you've you you took your time and then suddenly exploded. Is that how it feels to you? I think so. Yeah. I mean, we were sort of in the situation where me and Raymond had a, were in a band called the Boy Hairdressers. Mm. We sort of fizzled out, and we didn't. We didn't want to sort of start making singles again. So we thought we'd like make our own album, and we got about two thousand pounds. I mean, our first LP cost two thousand pounds to record. It's the right way to do it. Well, we just thought we, we didn't want to sort of waste a lot of time, so we just thought we'd bring it out. That, that's basically what happened. So that that came out about a year and a half ago or something, um, and then we've just sort of slowly played around the country and just sort of worked that LP. Mm. So you signed to Creation Records now, that's and right. uh, I read something about your next LP being an instrumental album or something. Well, that's right, yeah, we, we, we've sort of recorded an LP for America, and it was just sort of, I mean, it's like a mini album, and it's going to be sort of, like, I don't know, a mid-price thing. Yeah. It's just, but why an instrumental album? Well, it's just, uh, it's a... Uh, it's a wacky idea. Yeah, we just sort of liked the stuff when we, you know, when we did it in the studio. And so thought, this is your songs, not covers or anything? Well, there are a couple of covers. Oh, right, what have you yeah. covered? Well, things like Interstellar Overdrive and... Uh, well, Lake of Urchins on this album as well. Yeah, of course, it's on the, it's yeah, on it's the on CD the, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just sort of some things that we made up in the studio, some jams and stuff. Good, excellent. Really? So when's the next proper album full of uh, Teenage Fan Club songs coming out? Right, it's going to be out in October. It's called Bandwagon-esque. And it's ready? It's ready, it's completely finished. And okay. It's all set to go. I mean, you, you in a sense were creating such a vibe with uh, Paper House, you know, you're on, on, a, on the small label sort of tip that it almost was uh, unnecessary if you'd assigned to another label. And people, when you were being uh, sort of chased by record companies, assumed you were going to go to Warner Brothers or CBS or something. And then you go to, to a label like Creation. Why? Yeah, well, what, what's happening, happening is really that um, we're on Creation in the UK and Europe. But in America, we're on Geffen. Right. Um, we're to Geffen. <laughs> you and the so, Stone Roses and yeah, everybody else. Yeah, Stone Roses and Havana. And I think Guns, and and Guns and Roses and loads of... Guns and Roses, yeah. I mean, why choose, why choose Geffen then? I mean, why, why, why did you just decide to split this up? Because, you know, it could have been much simpler if you'd gone with one label for the world. Yeah, we just thought we'd like to... We thought that we could sort of control it more. If we were sort of, I'm, not, I'm not really sure now why we did it. I think we, <laughs> we, we had, I think it was some logical reason at the time, but, you know... I, I, I'm not really sure now. Was um, it? I mean, uh, it strikes me that you might have been quite happy with this, the kind of bands that Creation have signed, and that might be something you wanted to be part of. Yeah, I think we wanted to. Uh, we know that it's difficult to get uh, make a record successful or, or a group successful in America, so we knew that we had to sign with a, uh, you know, a, a big label. And like, um, I mean, at the moment, Geffen are doing really well, and they're breaking a lot of groups and stuff. And spending a lot of money successful. buying groups as well. Money, yeah. So I don't know. They seem to have the the money and. They've got, I mean, some of the people that work there, I know, that I'm, I'm meant to be really good. Well, I, I think there are, I mean, it's right to say that uh, David Geffen's a very clever man, but I think also there are a lot of uh, serious music fans across all of the sort of genres of music there, so it's pretty hopeful then. Yeah, that's right, yeah, I, I hope so. You know, do they love the album? They, they do, they really play, they really like it a lot, and they, I mean, they, get, they come over, they flew, I mean, we were all, we almost signed with Warners, and the, the guy came over, like, uh, guy from Geffen, and, you know, he sort of... Uh, wind and dined us, and <laughs> romanced us. <laughs> so we, we, I mean, yeah, candlelit dinner and that was it. Yeah, we swallowed the bait. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, we wish you lots of luck. Now, tell me about the performance that you're about to do here at the Marquee. Is it going to be uh, a lot of old songs, or is it stuff from the new album? It's a, a lot of things from the new album. Um, um, maybe, uh, well, a few. Uh, well, I think we're going to put more of the older songs in. Just, uh, you know, trying. I'm not sure. Just, I think we're, we're just sort of trying to put more in because in the last few gigs we've done, it's mostly been new songs and. I don't know, it's a, bit, it's a bit weird for the audience when they don't know mm. the material, so... Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Bit of a mix. And uh, you've picked another song here, which is, uh, which is an unusual one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, it's called Any Way That You Want Me, which was a sort of hit for the Trogs. Yeah. And it's sung by a woman called Evie Sands. Is this the original version? I think this is the original version. It was, it was actually a guy, a guy called Chip Taylor who wrote it, who wrote Wild Thing. And uh, 
it's, like a, it's a ballad and it's a really nice song. I just think it's, I love the woman's voice. Excellent. It's, it's great. Brilliant. We'll let you get back and get ready for going on stage. Norma, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Teenage Fan Club on soon.